Next, we're going to move into the world of concrete, and we've heard so much about low carbon concrete. Let's dig into what's really going on here. Got a couple of experts I'm going to introduce. I'm pleased to introduce Katha Redman and Max Morgan. Katha is the director of concrete products here at Granite Rock, where she's been for over 10 years, well over 10 years. This I think this was for a while ago, Katha, and um, is managing our concrete lab team. And she has a degree from UC Irvine, the Fighting Anteaters, and over 30 years of experience in the uh, concrete industry. Max is a concrete sales rep here at at The Rock. He came on full time in 2016 after four summers as an outstanding intern. He graduated from CSU Chico Concrete in Industry Management Program. And Max is, is very interested in sustainable concrete design. So Katha and Max, if you would take it away, uh, you should be able to drive your own slides. And there we go. Thank you. Max, you're muted. If you if you were giving us your best opening line, you're going to have to give it to us again. <laughs> thanks, Keith. Yeah, thanks for the introduction there. So uh, we'll jump into it. Today we'll be talking about low carbon concrete. And um, at Granite Rock, we're calling that Granite Green. So we're talking about concrete product, how it gets there, and the different components of that. So moving on, an overview. Um, Granite Green is our ready mix concrete initiative to produce sustainable concrete. Um, so three components that make up that is where it comes from, what's in it, and uh, how, how we put that all together. So Granite Rock uses locally sourced aggregates, um, which are environmentally superior compared to import just from the embedded concrete of or CO2 from transportation. Um, lo the location to your job site from the plant is also a consideration. Less energy to transport the material there. Uh, it said the greenest mile is the one not traveled. Uh, green concrete uses recycled materials such as fly ash, slag, and other SCMs in place of Portland cement. This helps lower the uh, the energy needed to produce concrete, as well as making use of waste products. This helps lower, reduce uh, greenhouse gases emissions, and it can also produce better concrete in way of strength, durability, and chloride resistance. Um, and then we'll also get into how Granite Rock is committed to making it better. So spending time and resources on really optimizing our mixed designs and thinking of how we um, up with new ones. So like I said, the first component of green concrete is uh, the transportation. So here's a an outlook of our aggregate sources and how we are local to the Bay Area. So anywhere we produce concrete, we have a aggregate source that's close as well as uh, rail lines to get them there, which is more efficient than than using trucks. So it's important to know where your aggregate comes from. Um, import aggregate can use up to five times as much fuel compared to locally source. Um, and we also use recycled aggregates. So that's uh, crushed from previous concrete as well as um, aggregate that's been in concrete, fresh concrete, uh, separated by a mechanical process and reusing the, the aggregate there. So just to get over an overview of what concrete is, concrete is a mixture of rock, sand, and water. Um, the main component that makes concrete so CO2 heavy is the Portland cement, uh, the production of it and the transportation. So Portland cement starts out as raw limestone that is quarried and then thrown into a kiln and heated to 3000 degrees. So that takes lots of energy to get that heat, as well as the heat needed to make the cement. There is a decarbonization process when the Portland cement turns from limestone to cement. Um, 
So a six and a half stack Portland cement mix, which is pretty common for everyday concrete, is about 600 pounds of CO2. So green concrete or, or granite green concrete, what we try to produce here, uh, reduces the amount of Portland cement in the mix by using supplementary cementitious materials. Um, the main two right now are fly ash and slag, which are from coal and iron production waste products. So getting in a bit more of what is cement, there's two types of cement. One is hydraulic, one is pozzolanic. Hydraulic is um, Portland cement, so that's going to be anything uh, like the, the lime that's been turned into cement. When it reacts with water, it produces a certain chemical reaction. So calcium silicate compounds react with water to form calcium silicate hydrates. And those are the crystals in the cement binder that actually creates the strength. Um, this is an exothermic reaction, and it also produces something called free lime um, from that. Pozzolinic are more siliceous compounds that produce little to no cementitious value by themselves, but react with the free lime. So you need, if you're using a pozzolinic cement, you need a little bit of hydraulic cement in there for that to work. Um, the ancient Greeks and Romans used volcanic ash um, to produce their, their uh, concretes there. And SEMs uh, work mostly on the pozzolinic side, but have some hydraulic properties. So going more into supplementary cementitious materials, like I was saying, they increase ultimate strength, but can uh, lower the initial strength, reduces the heat of hydration, uh, reduces the risk of alkyl uh, ASR, uh, it creates a more dense mix. So when, when these materials are combining with the free lime, they're also creating more crystals that wouldn't have been there. So that's that's helping create the strength and the density. And when you take away the uh, capillaries formed by the, the water settling, you're reducing the permeability, which helps uh, reduce its effect from outside um, chlorides coming into the concrete. Uh, also, the material is a little finer. The, the picture in the middle that looks like ball bearings, that's fly ash, and that material actually helps with the finish. It produces a, a smoother feel to it. And when using SEMs, they can reduce the uh, need for Portland cement, which lo lowers the uh, CO2 and helps projects get lead points. So here's a, a visual of, of how that chemical reaction of uh, cement and SEMs work together. So the, uh, the hydraulic reaction creates the calcium silicate hydrates and the free lime. Uh, the pozzolan reacts with the free lime to produce more calcium sil silicate hydrates, uh, which are the crystals that create the, the strength. Um, one thing to note is that when you take out the Portland cement, you are lowering the initial set. So you are creating a different product uh, and it reacts differently. Uh, is temperature dependent? Everyone knows that when concrete is colder, it sets up fast or slower, and when it's hotter, faster. Uh, so that's something to think about um, in, in low temperatures and using lots of replacement. Um, so here's a, a visual of the percentage makeup of how much an SEM is more pozzolinic or hydraulic. Um, the fly ash are mostly pozzolinic and slag is more hydraulic. So that means that it's going to uh, set up faster compared to when using fly ash as replacement. Um, so SEMs have a variable amount of lime silicates. The more lime it has, the more it's considered hydraulic like for cement, which is going to cause faster curing and allow for greater replacement. Um, for slag, the upper limits are about 70%, which is a high amount uh, because it has that hydraulic property. Fly ash acts less like normal cement. Um, so this is going to slow down the cure times. 
And you can also play with the, the three flash slag and cement to create um, optimized green mixes. Here's a, a temperature graph of three different mixtures of cements. So all, all the same cement content, just different replacements. The yellow line is a straight cement mix, so it, it gains the most temperature, meaning that it's going to set faster. Um, a 25% replacement mix is there in the middle with the dark blue line, and then a 50% replacement with the light blue. So it's something to think about. It, it's good to replace to lower your CO2 content, but then it's going to affect the, uh, the set time. So getting into some lessons learned and projects that we've um, played with low CO2 concrete. First one here is 101, 102 University Ave in Palo Alto. Um, we used slag for replacement and we, we got up to that 70%. It was a 376 pound per yard CO2 savings. Uh, the replacement mix was used in foundations, walls, slabs, and color concrete. And the one real learning lesson from this was that slag is a lighter color than normal cement. So um, when the color was introduced, it produced um, more of a pastel and lighter color that, that wasn't expected, but turned out well. SFO parking structure number two. Uh, this was a tricky project. Um, used 45 percent replacement in the footings and slab on grade. And one, one good thing here was by using slag, um, we were able to meet the, the corrosive um, resistance instead of using an admixture. So this stuff, slag is good for more than just um, CO2 replacement or lowering CO2 content of the mix. Um, the mixes uh, were able to save 270 pounds of CO2 per yard. Uh, but there is also a high early mix with SEMs in the, in the post-tension decks and beams as well as columns. Um, this was a challenge and really to get the extra SEM into the, the concrete, the overall sack content had to increase. It's really the same amount of um, cement was in the, the beams and decks, and it wasn't that cost effective. So when thinking about the, the, the time and schedule requirement of concrete, it might not make sense for a project. Maple Street Correctional Facility. So this um, project used 45 to 50% cement replacement with fly ash yielding a 270 pound per yard savings of CO2 using the foundations slab and concrete over metal deck. Uh, the lesson here was the slabs were poured in summer with high winds and with 50% replacement, the, the concrete set a lot slower and the contractor wasn't used to placing this concrete. So what happened were small um, plastic shrinkage cracking due to the, the wind causing the the top to set while the bottom of the slab was was still plastic. And that gets into plastic shrinkage cracking in fresh concrete mixes. So this is caused by rapid moisture loss. Just like the uh, example I gave, the um, what happens is when the top dries out faster than the bottom, it creates a potential for these cracks to happen. Uh, normal rate of evaporation is 0.2 pounds per square foot per hour. Things that can change this are temperature, wind, humidity, and direct sun placement on the slab. Um, so to, to mitigate this, the, the objective is to keep evaporations rate low when using a high replacement mix. Uh, check forecasts for the, the weather, factor in direct sunlight, uh, wind, and temperature. Uh, sometimes the job placement might direct sunlight into a certain area and cause a higher temperature. So it's important to control the temperature and slow the, the rate of hydration. Um, you can do this with a hydration stabilizer inside the concrete. 
um, try to use ice in the mix or um, substitute more SCMs to keep it from setting. Uh, slow the surface loss of, of moisture by using a vapor retarder immediately to help cause the loss. Um, the next one is to create wind barriers so it doesn't affect the slab. Increase humidity with misters uh, or altogether just postpone the, the pour to another time where you know that the conditions aren't going to negatively affect it. Um, one part to note is that the edges, because they are um, away from the center of mass where, where more of the moisture is, it, they are more particularly prone to the cracking and also follow ACI standards for washment ratios. So moving on to emerging technologies within the space of sustainability, uh, there's carbon injected concrete, recycled glass, which is a new potential SCM in type 1L cement, which is adding in raw limestone to normal Portland cement. So injected con uh, CO2 or CO2 mineralization is the process of injecting CO2 into freshly batched concrete. CO2 reacts with calcium ions to form nano-sized calcium carbonate. This can potentially increase the strength of the concrete. Um, by, by increasing the strength of the concrete, it's the, the, the thought is that you can decrease the overall cement needed. And just like SCMs re reduce the amount of Portland cement needed, it lowers the CO2 content of the mix. The industry has primarily shown that it's a reduction of about 4% cement needed for, for the same strength. So that's about 22 pounds of cement in a normal six sack. Uh, Granite Rock here, we are reviewing it. We've um, installed it for one project. So we are, we're very interested to see how that goes. Um, moving on to a new SCM. This is a uh, recycled glass. Right now, uh, it's not feasible just from the supply, but it is an, an alternate source as fly ash um, could be limited just due to the, the source, which are coal burning power plants. So one to watch for. Um, the waste glass is crushed and processed into a powder similar to this cement. And uh, it's been shown to typo. It's been shown to be able to replace up to 20% of cement. Um, again, the challenge is the production and getting enough into the, uh, the market. And uh, moving on to type 1L cements. So this is cement and blending in 5 to 15% of raw limestone ground up into a powder. So the, the lime in there reacts with the hydraulic cement and reduces the the energy intensive clinker from the, the, the limestones that have been put through the kiln. So some technology that Granite Rock has currently is our Verify system. So what it is, is an onboard measuring and managing system. It helps us produce a consistent slump from truck to truck, which can help us reduce overall water content of the mixes uh, helps us optimize them, and uh, provides uh, constant information of what's going on. So there's a lot going on here, but really the premise is that there's many different sensors on each of our trucks, which are controlled by a cloud-based system, which helps us, one, monitor what's going on with the truck, and two, measure it. So all of our trucks actually have the ability to um, add water up to allowable based on the mix design, as well as add mixture to control the slump. By being able to measure and mon monitor and um, manage all of our loads, this system has helped us create a, a tighter slump. And from that, that helps us decrease uh, our standard deviation for compressive strengths, which helps us optimize 
So what this is doing is by having a tighter control of our strengths, uh, we are able to get a higher average, meaning that um, we're able to look at pulling out cement, which is a CO2 heavy component of concrete to create optimized mix designs. This goes into how projects um, are designed and the requirements and how they can affect um, the CO2 content or global warming potential of concrete. There's two ways to think about it. It's prescriptive versus performance. Prescriptive is going to be um, calling out cement content, water cement ratio, um, and other areas by weight. Performance is going to be um, asking for a mix based on strength, shrinkage, and other areas that are more based on performance. So here's an example of, of kind of what we see every day, which is a prescriptive mix with a performance of 3000 PSI. So a six sack or 560 pounds of cement, 0.45 water cement ratio. The, um, the conflict here is 0.45 water cement ratio based on normal proportioning is going to cause or is going to call for a six and a half sack mix, which is higher than the minimum cement requirement. And we've seen that 3000 PSI can be achieved with uh, five sacks of cement. So if 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 all that's really needed is 3000, um, but this requirement is calling for 0.45, there's a 223 pound difference of CO2 that could be saved if this um, was just a performance uh, requirement versus the prescriptive components of it. So how does this all play into um, building currently? There's two things, lead and a EPD. So lead points are um, leadership and energy and environmental design, so green building certification program that recognizes best-in-class building strategies and practices. Uh, it was developed by the U.S. Green Building Council, NSF, and claims that 80% of current and new buildings uh, will be seeking this. So to receive LEED certifications, projects need to satisfy uh, certain areas for sustainable materials, practices, and other ways. Um, one way you can achieve that is by using uh, lower CO2 concrete, which is a higher SCM replacement and other stuff that I talked about. Um, there's different classifications for LEED, and it's, it's gaining each year as um, the U.S. Green Building Council is trying to push higher standards. New in the market is environmental product declarations. So what are these? These are basically the nutrition facts for CO2 and other um, components of different materials, in our case, concrete. So it's a third party certified life cycle assessment of every step um, in the production process from raw materials to leaving the plant gate. Um, it's based on 15 different criteria the, the ones to remember are global warming potential, which is kind of taking over for the CO2 content, ozone depletion, and water consumption. As we all know, those are very critical components. And this just helps um, customers value, also agencies value, um, the different products going into um, projects. And now Kath will be talking about more of the EPDs here. Great, thanks, Max. So I am going to kind of expand on um, some of the things that Max talked about. Um, I'm going to describe some of the low carbon mixed design tools that Granite Rock currently has in our arsenal. So one of those is our on-demand EPD generator. So this allows us to generate um, an EPD on any mix that we have in our system. Um, so in the past, we were um, given specific mixes with specific EPD um, limits. 
Whereas now we can take any mix that we design on the spot and immediately within a few seconds have uh, the CO2 content for that particular mix. Um, we also have an EPD analyzer tool, and this allows us to filter and analyze all the mixes in our system. And then we also have a project designer tool um, that allows engineers to log onto our system and kind of scroll through uh, that database and apply that to the requirements for their project. Next slide. So basically the EPD, as Max said, it's kind of a nutrition label for concrete is how we like to refer to it. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, little abbreviations that are associated with the EPD, but when a, an engineer is actually looking at the total carbon requirement, he's looking at the total embodied carbon. So typically you'll see that listed as EC, which stands for embodied carbon and it takes into account all of the materials that go into that particular project. Um, with regards to EPDs, there are two different types of EPDs. Uh, there's one that's called industry-wide, and then there's pr uh, product-specific. So the industry-wide is um, basically the association NRMCA. They take the entire industry nationwide and they compile all of the CO2 um, limits, requirements, um, capabilities, and they will come up with an industry-wide CO2 um, limit for each of the mixes. Now, they do that nationwide, but they also do regional as well. So there'll be specific um, industry-wide EPDs for, you know, the, the Western area as well as the, the East Coast. Um, and when you look at that, you're going to see specific uh, global warming potential limits, which is just another word for your CO2 value. So that will be abbreviated as GWP. Uh, we talked about embodied carbon, and then the units is kilograms of CO2 equivalent, um, which will be actually listed on the, on the EPD. Next slide. So for us, for Granite Rock, we have uh, product-specific EPDs, um, which was that second type. Uh, so product-specific means what I said is that we customize that to each specific mix design in our system. So typically your product-specific EPD, the CO2 value is lower than the industry-wide because we are utilizing our specific materials um, and everything associated with that. So what we have on the screen is just basically kind of a diagram of how um, that EPD is produced. So as the material supplier, we are inputting all of our information, including our energy, our transportation um, information into a database. Our database is run by Climate Earth. So they're our EPD practitioner. So they take all of that information that we input and they come up with an LCA report. And that's basically a life cycle assessment. So it takes into account all that information that I mentioned. Um, and then when we generate an EPD from our end, it takes that LCA information, it generates a draft EPD. So that's the first step. Then it goes into a third party verifier, which is the final verification. We utilize ASTM as our third party verifier. So that information will then go into the ASTM website. They will verify all of the information that Climate Earth has in their LCA. Um, if it's approved and passes mustard, then they come back with a certified EPD. And so this whole process looks like a lot, but it happens within 30 seconds. And then we have a printed EPD that we can attach to our submittals. We can give to an engineer or architect or anybody that's requesting it. Next slide. So as I mentioned, ASTM is our third party verifier. So all of our EPDs are housed and stored on their website. So you can log on to the ASTM website. Um, there's a specific section for EPDs. Uh, you find Granite Rock, and then you can sort through our EPDs by plant and by mix number. You'll be able to download that EPD and utilize it, you know, for any particular project that you need or any particular mix that you're interested in. Next slide. 
So this is our EPD analyzer. And with this, it's a huge tool for us because as you can imagine, we have quite a few mixes in our system. So what this allows us to do is sort all of our mixes and we can sort it by strength, but we can also sort it by CO2 value. So if in fact we have a project that has limited um, a maximum CO2 um, over on the right hand side in the orange column, we can actually filter. So we can filter, in this case, it's showing 300 to 500 um, GWP and we'll hit uh, a button there and it will give us all the mixes in our system that comply with that. And then we can filter it even further. As you go to the left, we can filter it by strength combined with that CO2 value, and we can also filter it by plant. So a lot of capabilities here. And it just helps us to be more efficient in identifying mixes that um, comply with requirements for specific projects. Next slide. So the next tool that we have is called our Project Builder tool. And I like this tool because it allows us to be interactive with the um, engineering and architectural community. So on the Granite Walk website, um, there's a little section, as you can see the green towards the middle where it says Climate Earth. Um, that's the whole section that will take you to our project builder file. So it's basically kind of a customized tool that allows us to engage early with the design community. And that way we're able to customize mixes for their project before it gets too far down to where there's no turning back. Gives us kind of an opportunity to make their designs greener or their requirements greener, you know, before, um, before it's too late. Next slide. So once you log on to the project builder, um, or once you utilize that link, you will come up to this website um, and it'll give you an opportunity to either log in um, if you've been there before, or you can set up an account. Um, once you set up an account, you will have full access to that database um, for your project. Next slide. Next slide. Thanks. So once you log in, you will come to this uh, project screen. So you'll enter your project information. Next slide. And then it will give you prompts to enter the requirements for your specific project. So you'll enter um, your application, whether it's footings or foundations, you'll enter the strength requirement for that. And then you will enter the quantity for each specific element. And you can do that for as many elements as you have in that particular project, or you can do it for one if you're just interested in one. Typically, though, for this, we're looking at the whole building um, CO2 impact. Um, so it, it's worthwhile to put all of the building elements in there so that you see what that total impact is. Um, and as you can see down in the green button, once you have all that information there, um, you'll hit calculate and then it will go in and it will scan the entire database um, of granite rock mixes. Next slide. Once you do that, it will give you kind of a summary uh, for each element, and it'll give you the minimum, mean, and maximum CO2 values that we have in our database for that particular element. So it will allow you, for example, if you're doing footings and you realize that you can use something with a higher SCM, then you can go to that maximum CO2 mix and utilize that. Um, if you have a high early mix where you need to get strength earlier, as Max mentioned, when you have a high SCM in there, um, it's going to take a little more time for that strength gain to occur. So you might decide you want to go with the, the minimum SCP, uh, I'm sorry, the minimum CO2 in that particular case, right? So you're kind of balancing it out. So where you can be more green in your footings, it gives you an opportunity to select mixes for that. And then where you need to have a little bit more early strength, which may have a little bit more CO2, um, it'll give you the option for that as well. As you can see in the button on the right, um, it, it allows you to download. So once you click the download, uh, it will give you a report. Next slide. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Oh, just back up a little bit, Max. Um, so while you're still on this screen, you can actually hover 
on on the pie chart here or on the bar chart and it will tell you specifically what the COD, CO2 values are for each particular design element. So you can kind of look at that even before you download the report. All right, next slide. Once you do download the report, here is what the report looks like. So it will duplicate that graph that you saw, but down below it'll give it to you in tabular form as well. So that way you have it all kind of in a summary. Um, you can print or save this report. Um, and once you download, um, we will also generate an email to you um, from Granite Rock that will also have this report attached. So you will get it in multiple ways. Next slide. Great. So basically, I want to transition a little bit. So we talked about the tools that we have available. Uh, Max also talked about some of the design um, limits and requirements. Um, I'm going to piggyback on that a little bit or expand on it some as well um, with ways that we can get to lower carbon mixed designs. Um, so basically, he talked about prescriptive and performance. That's exactly what um, we kind of look at that as a restraint or a constriction when you have a prescriptive design. So a prescriptive design is basically a recipe and it's telling us what to do. Um, we prefer to have a performance design which minimizes those restrictions and constraints and it allows us to design greener concrete. So in the first bulletin, we're talking about looking at specifications and determining if that spec meets the three ACI 301 durability requirements. So as you may be aware, in ACI, um, there are durability tables for corrosive environments. Um, it looks at sulfate, things like that. Um, it looks for water intrusion um, and just basic overall durability requirements. In those tables, it lists specific strength requirements um, for certain exposure levels, and it also met, uh, lists water cement ratio requirements. So what we would request that specifiers do is actually utilize that table as a guideline. So if in fact it's telling you that a 0 0.50 water cement ratio is what you need for your exposure environment to utilize that 0 0.50. A lot of times we'll see specifications that have a specific exposure limit, but the engineer chose to use a more restrictive water cement ratio requirement. So as Max said, when you use that lower water cement ratio requirement, um, that forces us to use more cement in the mix to meet that requirement. And that, that piggybacks onto bullet point number two, are we specifying arbitrarily low water cement ratios? So that's something to pay attention to. Third bullet, does it restrict the type or amount of cement? So many times we see a spec that states um, minimum cement content shall be, right? And then it has a strength that's not equal to that. So a strength that's lower than what that high cement content will typically get you. But our hands are tied. So again, we're restricted because we have to put in the extra amount of cement because that's what's specified. When in reality, we may be able to get away with 200, 300 pounds less, you know, and still meet that strength performance. So we definitely want to get away from that. Um, and then does the spec limit the use of SEMs? So a lot of times in a spec, we'll see maximum allowable SEM replacement, meaning slag or fly ash of 20% or 30%. Well, as Max showed you, we can use slag up to 70%. So if our hands are tied, you know, to 20%, 25%, that doesn't allow us to create as green a mix as we could potentially without that restriction. And then lastly, can a later strength acceptance age be allowed? So that's what we're trying to work with architects and engineers on. Um, for example, I mentioned that footing mix where you might be able to use a higher SCM. Well, typically concrete is specified at 28 day strength, as you know. Well, if we use the higher SCM, can we extend that 28 day allowance to 56 days, right? If we can extend it to 56 days, that means maybe I can put in a little more SCM and make that concrete a little greener, less CO2. So again, it's kind of looking at the overall picture, what the true requirements are, you know, and adjusting. 
So it basically takes kind of working with the entire industry, you know, as a whole, kind of as a partner uh, to get these CO2 contents lower. Next slide. Oh, and I think that's it. All right, Keith, that's it for me. Excellent. And again, anybody out there that is interested in in uh, putting in some questions, this is a really, really uh, chock full of information for us. You guys, um, nice rock solid job, no pun intended. Um, so I, I've got questions for you. Um, since you had talked about this this idea of of working together uh, with uh, specifiers, engineers and and architects, uh, is Granite Rock, and I know this is a softball question, so I'll start with that. Is Granite Rock willing to go out and do a brown bag lunch and learn, something like that, with any agency? Keith, yes, um, that is on our agenda for this year. Um, so we have started that process. We've actually completed one this year. Um, it was very successful. The engineer was uh, very receptive. Um, we were able to take his spec and go through his spec specifically and identify areas where we could make his particular concrete greener. Um, and we identified a lot of areas where he did not aware that he had aware that he had the conflicts that he did have. So he was appreciative of that as well. Um, and then he challenged us to come up with some greener mixes, granite rock specific mixes um, to forward to him, you know, for review um, to include in his designs. Good. And uh, both you and Max kind of touched on this in different ways, but if you're managing a project overall, uh, time is is a key element. And so you talked about 28 days versus 56 days. Um, say you're say you're managing a whole project. Well, if you ask for and are granted 56 days, what does that impact to the entire uh, project? Uh, duration and um, how can one manage that effectively and what does that call for the answer being um, get with your supplier early schedule early know what you're dealing with but go ahead and talk a little bit about the total time impact with um, managing these these different um, high SCM mixes I'll, I'll take that so um, like Kath was saying there's usually more flexibility with certain elements, saying footings, as opposed to post-tension slabs, which usually need strength in three days. So um, it starts in the design phase of knowing what elements you have flexibility of time with, and then it takes getting with whatever project team there is to build the schedule of um, the time to pour, waiting for it to uh, strip and move on to different areas. So it is something to think about and you need to do it ahead of time to be successful with it um, but we think it is a you know well worth the time to to help produce a, a better lower co2 um, building or project and um obviously and it's inherent and obvious um, communication is the key there so you've got to have this uh, constant communication and pre-planning and and have really good open discussions uh, as as Kathy, you in, uh, indicated in that in that lunch and learn that you uh, went to a, a contractor's office. Um, let's talk about some general things in in as far as um, uh, lowering carbon in concrete. Um, the one L uh, the one L cement. It, it is uh, and just I'm. I kind of got it finally, but that is really basically just adding raw limestone that's crushed to cement. Reducing, and so how does that react uh, chemically once it's put into concrete? How does the how does the one L uh, react these days versus um, everybody's favorite Portland cement that they've been using forever? So I'll take that one. Um, so basically, we do not have 1L up here in the Bay Area yet. Um, it is in other areas of California, so it's down in Southern California. 
Um, all of the literature that we have seen has shown that you are getting equal performance and equal performance with regards to strength, with regards to workability um, to the, the Portland cement. Um, we've done some internal testing in our lab. Um, so we've got some similar results. Um, we do not have field results yet. Um, so if that is the case, um, it's an excellent replacement, obviously because we're lowering that CO2 content because it's not taking as much heat to burn that limestone as it was to burn the clinker. So to answer your question, um, it should be equal performance. Cool. Um, and um, Kappa, just because I know you and I have worked on it a little bit, um, some of this um, Portland limestone cement has uh, shown up in other uh, cement based product. Can you talk about that just a little bit for those folks out there where will we might ought to see it already? Yeah, so they're they're using it in other industries. So they're using it in the block industry, a lot of other building materials. Um, so they utilize a bagged product as opposed to a bulk product to produce their materials. So the one L cement is available as a bagged product. So we're beginning to see it more and more in the building material products. Good. Can you guys riff a little bit on recycled aggregate and recycled aggregate in concrete? Yeah, um, I know we played with it a little bit. Certain cities are starting to require it. Um, we have done it successfully in footings for a large building in Sunnyvale. Um, there's two kinds. So there's um, recycled crushed and then um, recycled from fresh concrete. So the crushed is essentially you're taking a concrete member, crushing it, um, and then splitting it into different sizes and using it in the concrete, whereas the, the other is actually splitting the rock sand and cement um, from returned concrete uh, and then stockpiling that to be used. There, the, the concern with crushed recycled aggregates is that you don't know the original strength of the concrete that's been used before, so it does um, cause a question there, um, as well as the, the fineness of it. Um, there are usually a bit more fine, so there is a, a concern or, or thought of um, water content and water demand needed for that. Um, but, it, but it is viable uh, up to a certain percentage. Um, I think Kathy can talk more about the strengths, but we have seen that it's it's pretty comparable on strength there. So it, it is you know a good option or something to look at. Yeah, and the issue with that is um, for the agencies to allow us to use it. So that's the key is trying to get it into the market. Um, so Katrina may be aware um, there was a team in Caltrans um, that I worked on and we kind of looked at the advantages of allowing Caltrans to utilize some recycled aggregates um, in, in their pavements. Um, it is currently acceptable in minor concrete for Caltrans. Um, we were trying to get that extended to some of the pavements. Um, Caltrans was looking at kind of a two lift system to where they would have two levels of a pavement and they would allow recycled aggregate in that first lift, which is closest to the ground. And then in the second lift, then they would use their standard prescriptive mix. Um, so as of right now, we're kind of looking for pilot projects with Caltrans to test that out and then just basically evaluate the durability. Um, you know, once Caltrans is on board with that, um, then other city agencies that use Caltrans specs will also be on board and that will kind of expand the usage into the market. Very good. Again, folks out there in the in the field, if you're if you've got questions, comments or concerns, um, put them in the chat or raise your hand. We'll be happy to answer them. I've got a couple more for you guys before I let you go. We go on to Brandon. Uh, you talk so so from a kind of an overall standpoint, let me just have you all say that distance matters once more. Um, say it eloquently, say it beautifully. Go ahead and, and say uh, say something about distance matters. Uh, in in regard to green uh, in green building. So I'll, I'll relate that to concrete and aggregate supply. Um, 
for for us, we're using locally sourced aggregates, which are um, to our furthest plant about 60 miles. Um, in in the market, other aggregates are coming um, coming from British Columbia or other sources. So if you think about how much energy it takes to to, to drive from either, it, it's kind of obvious to see the the CO2 impact that that has. Um, there are different methods of transport, so truck, rail, and barge. There are different efficiencies there. Um, we have the the luxury of having rail systems set up to our plants, which does um, help us reduce the overall energy and CO2 impact uh, for getting those materials to to our locations. So um, there's that as well as um, the, the distance from plants to projects. That's one thing to consider. So obviously, if if we're nearby, it, it makes more sense to to do that from a uh, CO2 impact perspective. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, a little bit esoteric, some of the some of the details. You mentioned that that uh, slag impacted color. Can you just uh, reiterate what you said there? Um, I know that that was kind of an aha moment and it sounds like it worked out OK, but um, talk about that. Yeah, it produced desirable results, but um, like you're saying, slag is a lighter powder than cement as Portland cement is is typically gray uh, the slag is closer to a white color off white um, so when that's introduced at a high amount that's that's impacting the color of the paste or cement binder and uh, that's where the color pigment really um, binds to is and where you're seeing it is in the cement paste so when you're changing the majority of that paste to a wider tint or wider color um, when the integral color reacts with that, it creates a different um, palette. So it, it's um, there was a cool effect that came out in a good, good way. So it's always interesting to, to see what happens on projects. So again, uh, you know, as folks are specifying engineers and, and um, designing things, um, not only do we need to take that time element into consideration, but we have to take in uh, if they are dealing with color, they've got to deal with the color issue as well. Um, dare I ask, uh, would you guys like to talk about supply and supply chains um, for any supplementals and even cement and even cement? Is that too hot a potato to throw you guys? I want to yeah. say it's too too hot. Kathy, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start with that one. So um, as you know, SCMs are very limited, right? SCMs being the fly ash and the slag. Um, we went through a period of time about a year and a half, two years ago, where we did not have supply available of fly ash in the market. So we did have to switch over to slag. Um, eventually, slag will um, have an issue in supply as well. So that's why um, we're looking at alternative SCMs. Um, that's some of the ones that Max listed in his slide in his slides. Um, there is the glass pozzolans. That's kind of the, you know, the most hopeful. And that's where they're recycling glass bottles, any type of glass bottles, grinding that up into a powder and then using that as an SCM. Um, the performance there is very similar to fly ash. Um, but the issue, as Max mentioned, is um, availability. So we're hoping that over time that availability increases and as the um, fly ash and slag kind of, you know, wane, we'll have a replacement readily available. So are you saying we need to drink more glass bottles? Soda from? pop. Soda pop. Oh, soda pop. In a, okay. in a glass. Very good. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, you guys have been a wealth of information. Any last moment questions? Anybody raise a hand, just um, speak out if you'd like. This has been the concrete portion of today's Tech Talk by, uh, brought to you by Granite Rock. Thank you so much, Max and Katha.